this is like not news. Gas, like they, they've been known for a long time that gas stoves are bad for your health. There have been an increasing number of studies lately to, to really show this, but like uh, using a gas stove in an unventilated space is terribly dangerous. I mean, it is the tobacco industry when they hire doctors to stand there smoking cigarettes and saying, hey, this is this is fine, you know, and it is the the lead paint industry saying this is fine. And then fast forward a few decades and we're like, wait a second, we're dealing with, you know, the impacts of kids growing up with lead paint in schools and secondhand smoke. And that's not by accident. Welcome to Climate Papa. This is a show about climate change, technology, and parenthood. Welcome to Climate Papa, a show about the intersection of climate change, technology, and parenthood. I'm Ben Idelson. I'm based in Seattle, and I invest in product-led climate companies. And I'm a papa to two kids, a five-year-old girl and a two-year-old boy. And I'm very excited today to be joined by my friend Weldon. I learned a tremendous amount in this conversation and went down the rabbit hole all around gas stoves, health issues, and the magic physics behind induction cooking. The fact that we're burning gas in our homes to cook at this point is quite inexcusable. It's systematically off given all the better options we have, and it's one of the climate-related things that I feel most personally motivated to fix in my own house, given the health impacts to my family. We have magic devices to upgrade to. Just like the shift from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles feels like this massive upgrade, we're going to be looking back and think it was really quite primitive that we burned this stuff inside our homes. I'm really grateful for Weldon's work on this problem and to his deeply reflective personality as he thinks about how being a parent has opened up his empathy and further motivated him to work on climate. And as a side note, I was lucky to meet Weldon when they were starting this company, and I want to disclose that I'm an investor in Channing Street Copper. This conversation, just like all others, is not investment advice. So with that, here's Weldon. I'm Weldon Kennedy. I'm one of the co-founders and the chief marketing officer at the Channing Street Copper Company, and I have one little one, two-year-old Lyndon. I uh, live in Oakland and I work in Berkeley. What is Lyndon up to these days? He is full of words and putting them together as sentences. Uh, and also he successfully potty trained last week. So wow, congrats. he's got all sorts of, uh, of fun actions just in time for his second birthday later this month. Amazing. That's I, I feel like that's on the early end where you... He's, you know, he's me. really surprising us with some of the stuff he wants to do. It's so fun. Yeah. And it's a joy to see him have this eagerness to learn. And it like excites me and drives me to want to learn and do better myself. It's always really cool when they like have that self-awareness come in and our two and a half year old, we haven't pushed the issue, but he's starting to get interested in, in how those things work. So. Like the excitedness to grow up in that, like, just like thrill of new skill and thrill of growth you don't kind of realize how much of it you used to have, right? Until you're kind of like, you get to a point where you're like, oh man, why am I not like celebrating all these new, all my own new growth and all development? Um, because like we do continue to grow and like, it's just so much fun. I describe being a dad to other folks as, you know, when you have a friend come over and you show them your neighborhood and that you see all like the worst bits of your neighborhood, but you also see the best bits and you see how great it is. But like having a kid's like that for all of life and I see that so often that then like, you know, we're talking about potty training and I just see this like thrill of growth and thrill of development. And I'm reminded of how happy I, I can be and how it should be for every new thing that I learn and every new thing I get better at. Cause like last night he was, I mean, there was like a, you know, a, a potty festival and it was yeah. just like, <laughs> yeah. he's just so like, exciting. he's like, look what I can do. And it was so good. So and you, go, you go to the bathroom next time and you're like, wait, I should celebrate this. I, I did not, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? I did not urinate in my pants today. Like, why do I not get a gold star, you know? So to frame the next part of the conversation, I wanted to pause for a minute and give an overview on gas stoves and their health impacts. Today, about 47 million homes in the U.S. use gas stoves. It's actually more popular in blue states, particularly California, New Jersey, New York, and D.C. have by far the highest rates of gas stove usage. States in the Southeast, in particular, like Mississippi and Florida, have the lowest. So what is happening when we use a gas stove? Well, we're burning 
what is sometimes called natural gas, although more accurately, methane gas, that can have a number of things in it, but the primary thing that we're burning is methane. And when we burn methane, we're combining methane and oxygen in a reaction, and out comes water and carbon dioxide plus heat. That's fine, that's what we expect, and that carbon dioxide is, is not a health issue. But incomplete combustion yields carbon monoxide, which is a problem, and the high temperature reaction can yield nitrogen oxides, which is a bigger problem. And as I mentioned, it's not pure methane coming in. Some recent testing has been found that there's high benzene levels in the gas that's piped in the house, particularly higher in a lot of regions in California than in places like the East Coast. So what's the big health issue here? First, nitrogen dioxide acts primarily as an irritant that affects the mucuses of the eyes, nose, throat, and resp whole respiratory tract. Those of us with asthma or chronic pulmonary disease, even low levels can cause decreased lung function. And our kids are at an increased risk of respiratory infections, and there are some studies pointing to indoor gas stove use uh, as contributing to 12% of all asthma cases in the United States. When we look at benzene, it's even a bit more concerning. Chronic exposure to benzene has been associated with several blood disorders, and it's a known risk factor for other types of cancer, particularly leukemia and other blood cell cancers. So a lot of people point to, well, I have a ventilation hood and I can turn that on. It turns out these sort of work. Only about half of these ventilation hoods actually exhaust air outside of the kitchen. Most of them just recirculate it with a pretty poor filter in between that wouldn't actually remove these gases. And then the other issue is, as we all know, who use these, they're loud and people, only around 20 to 40% use them. So most people aren't even using these. So they're really not a complete solution. And yes, well, you know, we should use them when we can. They're not our solve for the health issues here. So let's jump back in with Weldon on this topic. First and foremost, if you have a gas stove right now, I, I kind of first got hit in the face with this. So I, I went to a visit a friend in Seattle and he works in global health, um, particularly maternal and child health. I was like cooking in his kitchen. He ran, and this is like in February in Seattle. And it's, it's cold and wet. And he just ran to the kitchen door and opens the door. And I'm like, what's up? He's like, oh, you know, it's gas stove, like really bad. And I, like, I hadn't really, this was uh, before I had my consciousness raised around this. And it turns out he's totally right. And, <laughs> um, you know, when we, we started like putting together our first pitch deck uh, for a copper, you know, I was thinking of it most as just like a gas replacement because of like performance and the same way as an EV is just like, hey, electrify everything and like your life's better. And it turns out the health risks around gas, when we were putting together the first pitch deck, I was like, oh, I need to find a major publications article around the health risks of gas. Let me just see what the New York Times has written on it. And I've just pulled up an article in the first link, literally, in search results, was from like the 1970s. Right? This is like not news. Gas, like they, they've been known for a long time that gas stoves are bad for your health. There have been an increasing number of studies lately to, to really show this, but like uh, using a gas stove in an unventilated space is terribly dangerous. And so anyone who has a gas stove, Please, whether you have children or not, make sure that you, and, and don't just turn on your vent hood. Turn on your vent hood as a starting point. Open a window, open doors, get some air moving through that space. Children are 42% more likely to develop asthma if they live in a home with a gas stove. Uh, and gas stoves cause 13% of childhood asthma in the U.S. The benzene emissions are worse than having a secondhand smoker. And so just like imagine inviting a, sec like a smoker to live in your home and <laughs> the health implications that would have for you and your family. I get pretty angry that we have been, I don't know, bamboozled, I guess, conned into saying, a, you know, hey, the, the best way to cook, the nicest way to cook is with this blue flame in your house. And oh, yeah, you know, turn on your range. You should probably should turn on this loud whirling machine and, that, and then all your problems are solved. There are many ways in which I'm angry from a product experience perspective and a climate perspective. But like that pales into comparison to how angry I am from a health perspective. And and I think the fact that essentially, in order to create lock-in for one of the last kind of emotional connections to having gas running to our house, we've put, we've invited a smoker in to smoke in our house. And that's a decision fine for us to feel good about and being excited to cook. But like, they're blowing that smoke into my two-year-old's face. Look, I, I grew up with a gas stove in our house. As I've gotten more into this, like my parents, my mom in particular was just like, I can't believe. And I was like, well... You shouldn't feel bad because there has been a hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent marketing this to, to you and to me and to everyone and telling us that you see it on buses and on garbage trucks. This runs on clean, burning natural gas. 
this story has been told to us again and again and again that, hey, this is, this is the safe, clean technology. If you're hearing this, if you're learning about this for the first time, don't feel guilt. Don't feel bad about it. Know that someone has been trying to con you and that now is the time to it's it's to the, I mean, it is the tobacco industry when they hire doctors to stand there smoking cigarettes and saying, hey, this is this is fine, you know, and it is the, the lead paint industry saying this is fine. And then fast forward a few decades and we're like, wait a second, we're dealing with, you know, the impacts of kids growing up with lead paint in schools and secondhand smoke. And that's not by accident. And I think it's particularly interesting because. To be clear, like this is not the main revenue stream. Like, not that much gas is used in burning a gas stove, so that it is a big emissions contributor in that like moment of burning. I mean, there's other issues, but it is actually like I think it's something like a couple single digit percentage of a home that's otherwise using a gas furnace, gas water heater, gas water gas heater, dryer. No. Correct. But you don't have an emotional connection to your gas furnace. You don't have emotional connection to your how you know how your water is heated because the end product experience is the same. There, this is why all the effort has been put into creating this emotional connection with gas cooking. It's in your kitchen, which is now the center point of our home. And it is the center point of where we're spending time with people and our kids. And, you know, so yes, like we've invited that cool smoker in to like sit there and feel good about ourselves while, yeah, poisoning all uh, us collectively. And I, I'm, I'm I'm feeling this because we still have, I mean, I, I want to be open about this. I still have a gas range and our house was built in 2019 and it was like not on my radar. I was not, I had not kind of crossed over and understood all of this and um, yeah, you know, working through how to, how to replace it. And so, yeah, every time I turn it on, I turn on an air purifier, the the hood and I open the window and I'm like, okay, I'm doing everything I can. But even reading about the hood ventilator, it's still not that effective. It would be much, much better to, to get rid of that and not be burning this this gas inside the home. So give me whatever version you want of how humans have cooked or whatever starting point and where we are in that story and, and some of the issues with, you know, in particular, I think, cooking with gas. Fundamentally, cooking makes us human, right? The, literally, our evolution is driven by the fact that we were able to, um, you know, process our calories in a way that gave us better access to more nutrition and our brains are able to grow and develop and we'd be, you know. Um, so, it is a fundamentally human thing that we do. And for a long time, uh, I mean, we've just burned things, right? With wood, with coal, whatever it was. Yeah, wood for, for the longest time, and then charcoal, uh, and eventually gas. Burn things, the predominant thing that we do now, uh, at least in the kind of Western world in, in a lot of places that are using cooking with gas, is we are heating a metal object and then cooking with that metal object, so a pan. Um, or we are heating a space like an oven and heating the air. But there are other technologies that are developed as well um, to heat that metal pan or to heat that space. Resistance electric is, is one of them. And resistance electric is you basically just run an electric current through a coil and that coil gets hot because the, it resists the electricity passing through it. And as it gets hot, it then transfers its heat to the pan or it transfers its heat to the air. That technology is what people typically think of as electric cooking. And it, it, fine, it can be a, a decent way to cook. It, it's slow. It, it takes a while to heat up that coil and then for that coil to transfer heat to the pan and then the coil retains residual heat. So as you turn down the temperature, it continues to heat the pan um, because the coil itself has thermal mass and it continues to hold that heat. And then induction is the newest and greatest of the technologies that exist for, for cooking that I think everyone will eventually have this just because when you use it, you're like, oh, this is just so obviously good. You're using an electromagnet to vibrate the iron molecules of a pan effectively, right? Uh, and the pan itself just gets hot. The inductor doesn't get hot. Any heat on the cooking surface is just from the pan, just passing it back to the glass cooktop or the uh, just, that you're sitting just, it on. Just because you said that quickly, I just want to like pause there one second because it is it is like a form of magic, right? I mean, anything usually anything it anything is. anything that like involves magnets is not intuitive physically. I think to our brains. I just want to nerd out on the physics of this a little bit more because I think it's so cool and invisible. So. If you take a coil of wire and you run electricity through it, around this coil of wire, there's a magnetic field. There's just this relationship between electricity running through something and a magnetic field around it. So you could take a compass and wave it around a wire that has electricity flowing through it, and you'll see the compass actually reacts to this magnetic field. And so what we're taking is a coil of wire, and we're oscillating the electricity, the direction of the electricity at a high frequency. And you're putting a metal pan on top of that. And so that 
magnetic field is then interacting with that metal pan. And what happens when you put a metal pan or a metal wire for that matter in a magnetic field, it creates an electric field. So it almost does the reverse thing inside of that metal pan. In this case, you get what's called an eddy current, which is literally a current of electricity going around and around that pan. And then that pan acts as a resistor. So just like a light bulb gets hot, that pan gets hot. So that wire underneath is creating a magnetic field that the pan is then reacting to, creating an electric field that's going around and around inside the pan. And the pan is acting as a big resistor where that energy is then converted into heat. And that's how you cook on an induction stove. Basically, as much power as you put into that pan, that pan heats uh, incredibly quickly. You don't have any efficiency loss of like when you're doing electric where you're heating the coil and the coil then passes the heat. You don't have the efficiency loss of gas where you're effectively heating the air around the pan. It's all of the energy is effectively going into the pan. So the pan gets hot really quickly. Uh, and when you turn the power off, the power delivery stops immediately. So again, with gas, you've heated the air and it takes a while for that air to dissipate for the pan to start cooling down. The resistance coil, it takes a while for the coil to cool down. So you get really high power delivery very quickly. You get really precise uh, power decrease really quickly because you are just heating the pan. And so that is the cooking technology of induction kind of at its core. And it's great. And, and that's just to be clear, that's just a cooktop uh, technology. Uh, really resistance coil technology for ovens is still very good. So just heating a coil and then blowing some hot air over that to make a convection electric oven is actually, it's a great way to heat oven very quickly and very precisely. And a lot of like high-end gas ovens even have resistance electric because it's better than using gas to heat an air space. And so, so when we talk about induction stoves, we're typically talking about just the cooktop and then the oven being a resistance coil convection electric. It's funny um, for folks that like are like, oh wait, like what is this new induction concept? The funny thing is that's how all wireless charging works as well. So if you have, you know, a recent right. iPhone, if you have AirPods, if you have an Apple Watch, if you have a wireless toothbrush, a toothbrush, a toothbrush you know, like, yeah. it, it is all the same thing. You can think of it as like wireless heating in that in that context, which I think is is very cool. And just like, you know, I don't know, you put your hand down on a wireless charger, it's not like all of a sudden your hand gets hot. It's because your hand is not in the right device. It, You're exactly right that it is a very similar technology. And in fact, with an inductor, you know, you can do, do not try this at home, but things you can do is you can effectively lay, if you have one inductor and you place another inductor on top of it and have the wires out, you can effectively just pass energy from the induction cooktop in through another inductor and out because it captures the energy. Like heating a pan is just kind of effectively one, one application. Correct. It is effectively a very large wireless power device. Um, That's so cool. And at least the types of things you could do, you know, design wise, right? I've seen people build inductors into kind of the the countertops that you don't even like see them. You literally just kind of have the marble countertop be the, the surface because again, the energy is wirelessly transmitted through magnetic fields. So it's a it's a pretty amazing thing when you kind of understand what's happening at that level and is is quite different than electric resistance, um, which people again are used to thinking about. Yeah, because uh, we're just used to thinking of fuel type, right? Fuel type equals cooking type, what really it's a totally different technology than resistance coil electric in yeah. terms of the way that the way that it works and the experience of using it. Why does not everyone have it yet? But because that's I think the the fascinating and frustrating thing is for a while it is a more complicated technology than resistance electric and so there it is slightly more expensive. But really the kind of why does not everyone have this yet? But Scandinavia actually this is the dominant cooking technology. Uh, there there are places where it's like seventy percent plus adoption because it is superior. The, the barrier is typically twofold. One, price competitive with resistance electric. So places where there are is, is just an electric stove. It's okay. If we don't really care, we'll get the cheaper one. And then when you're competing with gas, especially in places where gas is already installed, that delivers a lot of power. Having a gas pipeline into your home delivers a lot of power. And you to achieve a similar level of power delivery in your stove, the amount of electricity you would need uh, is is very high. And so typically a home is not a lot of homes, if you have like a 100 amp service to your home, which is pretty standard, uh, you won't have enough available power to your house to run a high powered electric stove and simultaneously do the other things you want, run your AC, charge your EV, have a heat pump, hot water heater, you know, washing machine, clothes dryer, blah, 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 all these things. And so the barrier ends up being a nice induction stove will be a 50 amp 
set of breakers in your in your breaker box and on a hundred amp home with 50 amp breakers um that's a big load and so that's why this thing isn't why why induction stoves aren't everywhere and so what we're doing at channing street copper is we're decoupling the performance of the appliance from the amount of energy available at the wall at any given point of time by using a large battery and so the battery charges up during the course of the day and then delivers the high power cooking experience that you want and the battery is size think of it not really as storage sizing so it's like far larger than you need for the amount of energy you'll use to cook a meal. The battery is sized for energy delivery. So the larger a battery you have, the more power output it can have at a given point in time. A car battery can deliver a lot more power than your phone battery. It's the, the C rate, right? Like how, how much energy can come out in an hour effectively. And so the battery is sized to actually deliver a lot of power really quickly. And so you get this really great high power cooking experience with an energy storage equipped appliance like what we're making. And so our goal is to make it so that induction is a technology a lot more people can get in their homes a lot more easily and not have to worry about all the infrastructure costs and all the logistical hurdles that come along with getting rid of a gas stove. And so hopefully more people can transition to this superior cooking technology and get rid of gas. Amazing. And to frame that, so you know, you said a 100 amp circuit in a home, basically half of the power might have to go to a, a high powered induction stove if you were to use what's on the market today. What does that look like with what you're building? Yeah, so ours plugs into a standard wall plug. So a, a 110, 15 amp outlet, right? Which, so it, effectively, no work is required uh, and no change in your home is required to, to install what we're building here uh, at, at Channing Copper because you can just plug it into a normal wall outlet the same way you plug in a toaster, right? And job done. And, and, you know, look, if you're replacing a gas stove, you probably have a plug right there next to the gas stove. If you have like an old antique one that doesn't plug into anything, you might not have a plug. Most stoves have an oven light, have the electric igniters, have a clock on them, you know. And so if they do, there's a plug right there and, and it's already plugged in. You might not even see it. The plug might be behind your gas stove and you don't even see it. So we just plug right into that same old plug and you're good to go. So the primary solve, and I think we can get to the multi multiple factors, but the primary solve is this kind of installation problem. If I have an electric, you know, stove today, I probably have the right amount of power prov provisioned for uh, the range of kind of upgrading to induction or not necessarily? You probably do. Um, you could probably upgrade to induction without much of a worry in terms of the electric costs. If you want a further upgrade and you want to have an electric stove that works when the power is out, a solution like ours is, is an additional value add. When you talk about just the pure economics of it, the cost of replacing a gas stove, we're talking about uh, that load center. So say, say you're at 100 amp service and to get an induction stove, you're going to need to go to a 200 amp service. Well, if you have trenched lines from your power utility and you have brick walls or your house is built with asbestos or if there's any lead paint that you're going to have to go through to run new wiring in your house, all of these things immediately just add cost and complexity to the entire problem. So if you have an, an electric stove and you have the power that you need and you can just swap one in, you can buy an induction stove for a good one, $1,000 to $2,000. It'll be a pretty good experience. But one interesting thing that you're flagging there, and I think in context, yes, you can make that swap, but in over the next five to 10 years, you're probably also likely to be swapping your gas furnace to a heat pump. You're likely to be swapping an internal combustion engine or two to an EV. And all of these increase the demand on that panel. And so the more that we can start to distribute the energy storage, the more we can perhaps not have to upgrade the, the energy coming into the house. Is that right? That's right. That's right. And, and you can absolutely avoid it. For, for a home, you don't need like a 200 amp service. Is, that's a lot of power, right? If you electrify everything at like the beefiest appliances, that might not even be enough. If you have a Ford F-150 with an 80 amp car charger and you're using a tankless hot water heater that's a 120 amp on-demand tankless hot water heater. I mean, these things exist and they're just like crazy power demands. But alternatively, there's a 120 volt heat pump hot water heater that works in warm climates like where I am today. Uh, you get a, an induction range like ours that plugs into 120. You get a uh, 120 heat pump dryer. Suddenly you're talking about, oh, okay, actually, I don't need to run into this problem of potentially tens of thousands of dollars of electrical work. I can just plug in these appliances. And I think that solution, like, look, if we're going to retire the half billion fossil fuel burning machines that we have out there, <laughs> like, we're going to need solutions like that that just make it easy and painless and simple and still deliver a delightful experience, right? Because 
genuinely cooking on our range is nicer than cooking on a nice gas range. And so it's like you're getting an upgrade and you're not having that any headache, no hassle to make that happen. And then once you have this energy storage appliance, like what are the other things that like, I mean, it's a bit crazy to think, yeah, I guess my power can go out and all of a sudden I can still cook. Tell me a little bit more about what you get from from kind of adding storage, you know, on appliance. There's a lot. <laughs> One, like I'll say just from the user experience, and this is something that like I've, I've used a lot of induction and I've tried all the different brands and technologies I possibly could. All of them, other than ours, when you turn it on, you are there's this like hum and rattle and buzz that you still hear. So the inductor is doing like a kind of power factor correction on the AC that's coming out of the wall, but there is still residual the 60 hertz signal in the US, our power is at 60 hertz. And so you can effectively hear that wave in the pan kind of humming or like that the buzz especially like some clad pans where there's like an aluminum layer between stainless layers or you have a, a lid on it that's just like a pure stainless lid it can you can get a, like a buzz when ours dries off at dc so that 60 hertz signal is gone right it just because you're driving off the dc straight out of the battery and so like one thing straight away of using an energy storage equipped appliance is it's sm like it's just buttery smooth and silent you, you never realize how loud a dirt bike is until you're suddenly like on a bicycle. An internal combustion engine where you have all these pistons firing and then all of a sudden right? you're seeing an EV and it's like, wait, this is just direct power that's silent and clean. Like this is... Everything's yeah. lovely. Yeah. yeah. So you, like you get that kind of really nice, clean experience that, that that's lovely. Then when you're cooking and the power goes out, great, keep cooking, right? So as I was saying, like the battery is sized principally for the amount of power it can deliver for peak power, right? So that you can preheat your oven in five minutes by just dumping a lot of energy into that oven, or you can boil a giant pot of water for, you know, mashed potatoes for 20. Um, and you can deliver a lot of power for that really quickly. So actually you're oversized for the amount of storage you would need to cook several meals. You can keep cooking. Now, I wouldn't say, hey, let's turn on the broiler and do chicken satay skewers for 100 people. That's probably you know, you're, you're going to bump up against your storage capacity uh, there. But if you're like, hey, the power is going out and I need to make my family dinner, you will not have to worry about it. You're all set, right? So that is that is a great additional benefit. And then one of the things that like I'm really excited about, I'm, I'm partly into this for because of the motivation for the climate impact that we can have. And, you know, induction on its own is a great way to get rid of gas and have a positive climate impact. But using an energy storage equipped appliance is even further in that climate impact because what you're doing is you're so soaking up peak renewable energy production during the middle of the day here where I'm sitting or, you know, if there's a high wind at night, you know, wherever you are. Um, but like you're soaking up that renewable energy and using that in what otherwise is typically the dirtiest time of the grid. So that 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. is the dirtiest energy typically because that's when gas peaker plants are turning on to be able to satisfy demand. And so you get all sorts of benefits, right? You get this like perfectly silent, you get resilience, and you get the fact that this is by far and away the most beneficial climate appliance you could possibly have uh, when it comes to cooking. So a yeah, lot of good this, stuff. Okay, I know there's multiple ways to attack this issue of, you know, as we move to renewables, we're going to need to increasingly store the energy from, the, from peak cheap energy generation to then be used Yes, we're going to look at grid scale ways to do that, but also the more we can perhaps move that down to the household or the appliance level, it, it feels like the faster we can get there, right? Getting people to adopt EVs, getting people to upgrade their stoves, getting people to, you know, maybe add tanks of hot water back to their homes that are heated up at the right time. These are all ways that then start to shift when we can consume power off the grid from when we end up actually needing it as a consumer. I think it's a pretty interesting like theme in all of this. Let's dive a little bit into the battery because, you know, I think that's that's this new concept to be like, hey, I'm buying an appliance. I have a phone and a laptop and a watch and all these things. And my headphones that I'm using right now, these all have batteries and I'm used to kind of dealing with. And obviously EV buyers are kind of used, are now kind of conceptualizing that they have a much bigger battery in their life than perhaps they've ever owned before. But what does it mean for there to be a battery in my appliance? How should I think about what it is to manage that battery? Do I need to manage it and maintain that battery? Is it like my Apple Watch battery that might you know, die in three years or is it a different technology or? Yeah. So the first thing to do is like, it, it is a reconceptualization. Like it is a battery, but we refer to it as an energy storage equipped appliance because we want to like challenge the way people think about the energy storage and the way that works. Because all those devices that you described, the principal point of the battery being there is you're going to take it with you and you need energy on the go. 
right? Your headphones are not attached to anything. You need energy on the go. Your laptop can stuff it in your bag, break it out at a coffee shop, type it, you're on your go. Your watch stays on your wrist, not plugged into anything bad, like energy on the go, right? And so uh, lithium, lithium ion batteries, principally the uh, nickel manganese cobalt, lithium nickel manganese cobalt chemistry is kind of what we think of when we say lithium ion battery, you know, the, and you hear words in there like cobalt and you know the stories of uh, cobalt mining in the DRC, um, Democratic Republic of Congo, and you know the kind of risks around batteries being compromised and the potential for fire or like e-bike batteries being compromised and the potential for um, for fire is ground though so like you you know the story of those sort of batteries right mobile lightweight tons of energy storage limited lifespan have some risks around them uh but very familiar in our lives what we're talking about here with an energy storage equipped stove with ours is a uh, lithium iron phosphate and so you hear that lithium part and everyone's like ah same very different so this is a chemistry that is designed specifically to just sit still and probably be plugged in its whole life. Um, so it is a less energy dense storage. It would not be very good for a watch or a laptop because you'd have a much bigger, heavier battery. Uh, but and an appliance... A Apple's, that, not, Apple's not playing with many of these batteries. <laughs> no, no. But for a device that's going to sit still in your kitchen for its entire lifetime, it's a great solution. And so actually the place you see it typically most deployed is in um, servers. So like computer servers that need an uninterruptible power supply, lithium iron phosphate, they all have that. And you know you can buy server rack batteries that are uh, lithium iron phosphate. Uh, and that, that's a pretty cheap packaging solution for them because it is as, at scale, they've been produced and deployed all over the place for a long time. So they're, the advantages you get though, so you, you basically, you have a much heavier, less energy dense battery. So that's the cost, right? That's the price back you pay. To, back to like not, Maybe not portable. Maybe you don't want to throw it in your backpack, but it's attached to an but, appliance that's sitting there in your house. Like, who cares if it weighs an extra 50 pounds? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so you, you sacrifice that, but you get a lot better lifespan. So eight to 10,000 cycles is what you see on a lithium iron phosphate battery. And so that's daily cycling for 20 years. So it, this might outlast the rest of your stove, right? This battery, it might be that instead of thinking about replacing the battery, you think about replacing your stove and keeping your battery, right? Just swap the device around it and so that re kind of re-envisioning what a battery means in that sense and the, mat and the materials uh, mining doesn't have the same issues doesn't have the same problem with materials mining you don't have the cobalt you avoid a lot of the conflict mineral so yeah the, like overall there are a lot of wins to be had here and then also no thermal runaway issues well not the same thermal runaway issues that you see in nickel manganese cobalt chemistries because if the battery is compromised um, like severely damaged it, it will get hot and it will smoke but it will like spontaneously burst into flames like a um, like a lithium nickel, nickel manganese cobalt can if you like break it open so it, it'll discharge its energy but it will not do so as dramatically or as dangerously and so basically you end up with much better lifespan much safer not like not the same kind of ethical concerns around the mining implications and that's that's what you're looking at the consumer decision around this to the extent that consumers are builders making the decision to put one of these appliances in and the fact that the energy storage is built in, I think generally can be kind of a non-factor from a daily experience perspective, except when the power goes out and then you're like, oh, great. I forgot. Like I have a big battery sitting in my kitchen that I can, you know, still cook on or if I have a plug, you can plug something in and like, isn't that handy? It's almost this bonus feature around it. And then it happens to then have kind of all these, it's, it's really there as the solve around installation and the solve around, you know, using cleaner, cheaper power. So it's all these invisible infrastructure benefits, except when the power goes out and you have resiliency, right? And which is a pretty cool product framing. So Weldon and I wrapped up talking about all these new benefits of induction cooking and the device that they're building. And then as often happens, we kept talking and I turned back on recording, talking about needing to be an optimist to have kids and work on climate. You'll find it, but I think there was an Ezra there Klein is, There is, there is. A, he had a, a, really a series powerful. basically on the choice to have children. Because one of the things that's like published in these like carbon footprint things is so often is like, oh, the best thing you can do to like reduce your carbon footprint is not have kids. And like, ah, I'm sorry, but like, get out of here with that. Like, you know, the best thing you can do to reduce your carbon footprint is shoot yourself to Mars. I mean, Jesus, you know, just like, it's just like illogical. It's the most pessimistic. It's back to what you said. 
you fundamentally have to find where you straddle the line on belief and bet on the future or yeah. not. And yes, there's a kind of anxious protect protectionist side of us that is going to always lean into fear and lean into, you know, yes, all these things are going to go wrong and they are going wrong and we're consuming kind of the news cycle and like, and climate news is particularly scary. And it's like, yes. And that's always been there, right? Yeah. There's always these risks. And there are a lot of ways in which today is the best day for humans that it's ever been. There are a lot totally. of ways in which it's not. And for a lot of humans, it's not. And like, it is up to us to decide the trend of it. And yes, having kids is scary. Like from the moment of pregnancy to probably the rest of my life, I am afraid that something could go wrong. But I choose that fear coupled with all of the life experience it gives me and the leaning into the optimism of the trajectory of their lives and mine with them over the fear that's just going to keep me curled up inside because something could always go wrong, right? And it's like, fundamentally, you have to decide how you want your life to center around living life or not. And to me, like living life in the most bold way is, for me, like being a parent. Yeah, no, 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 it absolutely is. It, it absolutely is because it's it's not just in your own tomorrow. It's in tomorrow's beyond your reckoning, right? It is It is this bet that things that you care about will endure far beyond you. Uh, things that you love will endure far beyond you and you have to create a good space for them. So it is, it's not just optimism. It, it's embracing this onus of creating a good future. And it is a, it's a light load indeed. Like when you, when, you, when you love your kid and you imagine their future, making that future better is no burden at all because it just feels like the, the obvious thing to do. And so like, you know, it makes showing up at work. It makes choosing to do good things like that much easier and that much better. And and also like having kids, I think also, I don't know, forces like the empathy uh, part of your brain to go into overdrive because like I spent most of my time as a, an adult interacting with other adults. I had relatively little interaction with children. You know, I had friends who had kids and everything, but short interactions with them. Uh, and then just being around a small child all the time and just having to adapt and adopt that worldview and see how different it is and how how hard seeing the world is through those eyes. You get this like empathy overdrive. And I feel like, oh man, you know, now when someone like burns through a crosswalk and if I'm like waiting at the crosswalk and someone burns through, I'd be like, oh, that person's a real jerk. But I feel like Dad Weldon now sees that person like, I feel so bad that they're that late. You know, it's like the, the, my default assumption is like, God, like life is hard, you know, and like, yeah. uh, and I yeah. think that like maybe they just tried to get out the door today. Maybe it was a battle this morning, you know, or something, you know, obviously, you know, potentially more serious, but those battles can be yeah. hard. And I, but I feel that that like that empathy overdrive is like when paired with the, like what we do need to do, right, which is we need to get a lot of people. We need to get billions of people uh, motivated to make the the right choices. And some of those choices will be easy to flip because the technology is easy and obvious. And some of them are going to require some sort of cultural change or behavior change that takes some acceptance, right? If like, and, and when I say easy to flip because the technology is obvious, like if you are culturally in love with the internal combustion engine, and there are a lot of people who are, like even though the EV is a more powerful, faster, fun, clean experience, there is still a cultural barrier to overcome. And so like having that empathy to understand that people are going to have a hard time with that journey is like a thing that we need to, to be ready for. And I feel that it's easier to build that future. It's easier to bring other people on that journey when you're like, for me, at least that parenthood has been a, a significant part of making me more empathetic. And I really appreciate that. So thanks, Lyndon, for that one. Well, that's episode 11 of Climate Papa. This episode was edited by Stuart from Castos. And please share this with anyone you think would like it. One of the biggest things you can do to help is to please subscribe or follow and review this show in whichever podcast app you use. And visit anytime at climatepapa.com for more episodes and some of the other content we've been sharing. I love hearing from listeners and would love feedback in particular on some of the tweaks in the format we've been trying in this episode. And lastly, our music is the Balkan Bump remix of Mellow Kind of Hype by Slink and Lazy Syrup Orchestra. Let's have them take us out. On we go like...